of this session. And so stay with us until the end. Um, Productize Conference is um, annual immersive hands-on experience that we have been organizing since 2015. We were really, really lucky because Reza Torres was actually one of our very first speakers back in 2016. Um, and we have great memories of her talk. And that was five years ago, <laughs> time flies. So we do have an, a new uh, format this year. It's called the Master Classes. And it's happening the 27th and the 28th of May, 2021. Um, it's two days of hands-on master classes with the best pros. You can choose your own uh, four master classes track. You get practical tips from pros like Teresa Torres. You network with fellow participants. I cannot promise you beer, but I, I can definitely promise you lots of fun and good conversations. And uh, we also get, you also get certified product training on enterprise and consumer product. So um, the way this works is you, you do your own track so you can go to whatever masterclass you want provided they're still available. Um, and whether you go to enterprise or a consumer, um, it, it's really up to you. And the good news is that you can buy a discounted ticket with the code Teresa today, and that will make your ticket um, really, really, a really um, special price of 99 euros, um, which, which I, I'm, I'm really, really happy that we are still selling until the end of this month. So Teresa is going to be one of our masterclass trainers, and she's going to give a masterclass on how to identify and test your solution assumptions. Um, she's going to speak on the 28th of May and her masterclass is still, still has a few spots available. So I think this is a great opportunity for you to take that. Um, also, because we have a special offer with each ticket, you get her new book, which is coming May, 2021 the continuous discovery habits that we're going to talk a little bit more during this um, live podcast. So with no further ado, let me just stop the share and welcome our guest speaker today, Teresa. Hi, Teresa, how are you? I'm doing well, how are you? I'm doing, I'm doing good under the, the current <laughs> circumstances has been, um, you know, Happy 2020 for event organizers. We had to adapt and adjust, but I guess that's been the drill for pretty much everyone. So we are here also with, with Paulo, and, um, and Paulo will be my co-host today. He's a product manager. He's also a friend. So for the past few Thanks, years, we've, we've been doing a series of interviews with product innovators that have been able to beat the ceiling, become successful makers and entrepreneurs and product people. And our mission is really to inspire, to connect, and empower more people into getting into product roles. And I think that's very much from the beginning since we met five years ago. Um, so our guest today is Teresa Torres. If you don't know Teresa Torres, let me just do a quick um, brief intro to her work. So Teresa is a product discovery coach, and she helps teams gain valuable insights from their customer interviews, run effective product experiments, drive product outcomes at great value for their customers and their business. She teaches a structured and sustainable approach to continuous discovery that helps product teams infuse their daily product decisions with customer input. She's coached hundreds of teams and companies of all sizes from early stage startups to global companies and has taught over 6,000 product people core discovery skills through the Product Talk Academy. She is the author of this upcoming book, Continuous Discovery Habits, and she blogs uh, notably at producttalk.org. Hi, Teresa. Welcome for, you know, for being with us today. Let me jump into our first question. It's been a while since we last met here in 2016 in Lisbon. Um, and I think you've been dealing uh, with, you, with, you know, with this current crisis. I've been reading your Twitter feed. I, I know you've, you started mountain biking. 
<laughs> so how are you <laughs> discovering uh, the new self-improvement opportunities yourself? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I'm kind of addicted to learning new sports. So there's always something going on. Um, I, in, in 2019, I started spending time in Bend, Oregon, which is this pretty spectacular mountain resort town in central Oregon. Um, and so I'm 10 minutes away from pretty spectacular mountain biking trails and 20 minutes away from a nice ski mountain. Um, and actually in 2020, it's been our lifesaver because uh, while most of the world changed and the things that we were able to do became extremely limited, uh, outdoor play has been mostly unaffected. Um, so it's been nice to have a little bit of normalcy uh, throughout the year. Um, but as far as I, I'm always looking for uh, what's the next new thing, whether that's um, keeping me active, physically active or mentally active. Uh, most of my um, sort of blog readers know that I read a ton of books. I always recommend a book in my monthly newsletter. That's a big part of it. Um, I think really it's just my constant search to not get bored um, and, uh, and to really just kind of keep myself entertained. Great. And mountain biking in, in Oregon sounds really exciting for sure. So I, I remember I was actually re-watching re, uh, your, um, your talk from 2016 uh, here in, in Lisbon at Productize 2016. And you said, and I'll be quoting you on this, um, the following, five years from now, so that's 2021, <laughs> there's going to be 10 new books that I could recommend you. Uh, five years from now, we will be talking about two completely new methods other, other than design thinking and jobs to be done. So the important thing to remember is that our goal is not to create good user stories, but as product manager, product people, is to drive a desired outcome for our customers that creates value for our business. So my question to you, you're releasing this new book, Continuous Discovery Habits, very, very soon in May. Um, is this one of those five books that you were talking five years ago <laughs> <laughs> that you didn't find out? You had to, yeah. write, to write it yourself? That's a great question. So first, I want to start with the timeline on the book. Um, so I don't actually have a publication date yet. So I just want to, I don't want to overpromise and not deliver. Uh, our official timeline on the book is late spring, early summer. Uh, that okay. might mean May. Hopefully, it's going to be right around there. Uh, COVID has introduced a lot of uncertainty into publishing times and uh, we're in the last legs. It's going to be here soon. Um, yeah, so in that talk in 2016, what I was trying to do was to sort of zoom out and take this sort of historical view of um, where are we in the industry? How do we get here? What impact has that had on our discovery practices? I actually still refer to that talk. All of my coaching students watch that talk in week one. Um, I actually, th I think it does a really good job of sort of putting um, uh, giving that longer horizon perspective on why are our methods changing. And what I was trying to get at at the end of the talk, when I sort of talked about, it's not really about our tactics. It's about, I was seeing a common structure that underlied all of discovery. And I define that common structure as simply as um, we need to be outcome focused. We need to discover opportunities. So customer needs, pain points, and desires. And then we need to discover solutions. And what I was seeing at the time was that a lot of teams were starting to think about how do we discover solutions, right? The lean startup made, helped us take a giant step in the right direction in terms of discovering solutions. Mm -hmm. Jobs to be done took us in a big uh, step in the right direction around um, discovering opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, the rise of OKRs is helping us take a big step in the right direction around discovering outcomes. Um, what's funny is people ask me all the time, like, okay, it's been five years, what are the new tactics and frameworks? Exactly. And we actually, I don't see a lot of new ones. And actually, I think that's a positive thing. I think that what it means is we're focusing on getting good at those core activities instead of chasing every new sort of framework or, or um, tool. And then mm -hmm. as far as my book and how do I think it fits in there, I'm really trying to focus on, from day one, have been trying to focus on what is this common structure that underlies our discovery so we can start to make sense of um, how to do our work. And so my goal with the book is to, it's, uh, is to create a guide for a product trio or a product team um, to be able to start with an outcome, discover opportunities, and then discover solutions. It is full of tactics, uh, but I think the real value in the book is less the individual tactics and more that sort of end-to-end -end 
um, structure for how do we how do we start with this wide open problem of deliver an outcome and actually get to what's the right thing to build? All right, it's more a chart, navigational chart than than a new method or methodology. So you're going to be one of our trainers here at the master classes, um, May 28th. And your master classes uh, or your master class is how to identify and test your solution assumptions. So can you give us a sneak peek and why the focus here in solution and not problems or opportunities? Yeah, so I've talked a lot about um, the opportunity space and discovering opportunities. So I wanted to, especially with the book coming out, I wanted to um, talk about the other side, discovering solutions. Um, mm -hmm. The book has some, what I think are some gold nuggets that I've sort of held close um, mm -hmm. because it's something that I've offered my coaching teams and in some of my courses. Um, and I really wanted, and it until the book comes out, it's not something that I have um, sort of been very um, public about in my blog. What's one of the challenges I have is um, I need to run a business to um, survive. And I also want to help the industry um, uh, progress in its practices. And so there's always been sort of this divide of like, what do I blog about for free versus what gets included in a paid program, like a course or mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. a workshop. And so with the book, I'm basically just giving all of it away. <laughs> I mean, I feel like we're just at the point where teams need this. And so uh, I think in both the key to discovering solutions is shifting from this testing ideas mindset to testing assumptions. We all know this, the Lean Startup introduced this concept. Uh, but doing it in practice is really hard because it's hard for us to see our own assumptions. And so in the book, I get into really specific tactics around how do we surface assumptions. And part of the reasons why I've kept this really close um, and haven't shared it in the past is because I don't see other people teaching this. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know that I see other people teaching how do we uncover our assumptions. So that's going to be in the book. We're also going to do a deep dive on it in the master class. I feel like okay. the master class is close enough to when the book comes out that it's the right time <laughs> to start sharing. Like here's yeah. some gems for people. Great. So Paul, do you have any questions as well? Uh, yes. <laughs> Again, uh, Teresa, thank you for being with us today. Uh, I'm such a big enthusiast about your work and frameworks that uh, make uh, our product jobs much easier. And now for this uh, new upcoming book, I'm, uh, I'm very thrilled and uh, expectation to, to buy it. Uh, as a product leader, uh, what do you think are the top product trends and disruptions we are going to see this year, uh, uh, probably the next year? What's your thoughts about it? Yeah, this is a good question. So this is a little bit like what I was getting at back in 2016 with uh, things are always changing around us, but I think our jobs are to look for what's stable year to year. Um, so I try actually not to get too caught up on like what's the new crazy thing year to year. I will say that I think we learned a lot in 2020 about remote work and how to work remotely effectively. I know a lot of us really miss being in the office and we are probably going to get back to working together in person at some point. Um, but I think what's great about everybody learning how to work remotely is that it, especially from a discovery standpoint, it opens up a lot of um, avenues towards us to, to us that maybe we weren't comfortable with in the past. So whether that's doing remote interviews and being able to talk to customers all over the world instead of who's just locally convenient to you. Um, so I think that trend is definitely going to continue through 2021. Um, and then beyond that, I think it really is, I think we're just going to continue to fine tune and refine what we're doing. I think we're starting to see teams really start to understand this difference between project-based work and continuous work. And that mindset shift is so challenging for people to imagine it before they experience it but I'm starting to see a lot more people kind of take their first steps into a true continuous mindset. And I hope that continues. Great. Let's uh, discover <laughs> what the trends will be. Thank you. Um, uh, you, you often, you often refer to Marty Kagan. I, I think he's this coach, right? Uh, from, from him. We need product uh, teams of missionaries, not teams mm -hmm. of mercenaries. Uh, and this uh, relates to bring developers and engineers close to the product team instead of giving them uh, like a list to build. Uh, can you share your thoughts about this scout in the context of your work, product discovery, and why this is so relevant in modern product teams? Yeah, so software is complex, right? We're building complex products. And I think when we first started in the software world, we tried to think about it as any other product. We tried to make an analogy between making soap and making uh, software. Right, and with soap, I'm, it's not, I'm not saying soap is simple because there's a million variables too and what consumers want is probably even more fickle than from a software standpoint. 
But when we're talking about traditional products, um, what made a traditional product successful was not just what the product was, but how it was distributed, how it was priced, the brand behind it, the, the sort of levers that we pulled um, were a little, were, were less dependent on how the product was built, not independent, but less dependent. And what we're seeing with software is that you can have a great brand, you can have great distribution, you can have great marketing, um, but fundamentally, if the product doesn't work well or match your consumer's expectations, it's gonna struggle to survive. And I think what we're finding is that software is so complex um, that getting all those details right is really um, a hard task. And so it's not as simple as like, let's just get in a room and define what we want to build and then hand it over to the wall to the engineers and hope they build it right. Um, instead, what we really need is we need to leverage their expertise, right? Our engineers tend to have the most knowledge of what's possible with technology. They tend to be really good analytical thinkers and creative problem solvers. And I think the idea of team-based discovery is just acknowledging that um, we have a lot of smart people on our team. How do we leverage all of them? And how do we make sure everybody's close to the customer and that we're collaboratively solving problems? Um, and I think we're gonna see not just in the software world and not just in the product side of the software world, um, but this is a trend that I think business is moving towards. I can't say this year because business moves gl glacially slowly, um, but I do think product practices are pulling business um, further in the direction because our product practices were designed to help us manage uncertainty. And if we learned anything in 2020, it's that the world is uncertain. No matter how much we want it to be certain, uh, the world is uncertain. And I think the rest of business is going to follow. It's just going to take a glacially slow pace for them to follow. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, in, in this context, uh, what are the typical problems um, that product teams face when they get in touch with you? And how uh, do you help uh, uh, to solve uh, the, these uh, problems, these issues? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. It's kind of all over the place. So I work with, I've worked with a lot of different types of teams in different industries, different company sizes, um, and also different levels of maturity with discovery. So sometimes I get a team and they've literally never talked to a customer. They're being tasked with an outcome for the first time. They're not really sure even how to frame an outcome. And we're really starting at the very beginning. And it's like, and they're a team that historically has been told exactly what to build. And now they're faced with this really open-ended unstructured problem of move this number and they don't even know where to begin. Uh, so that's some of my teams. Uh, sometimes I get to work with teams that actually are really good at discovery already. Um, they've already adapted a lot of the industry best practices. And really what we work on is that shift in mindset from a project-based mindset to a continuous mindset. And how do we move towards this more continuous cadence where we're um, engaged with our customers week over week and we're shipping value week over week. Um, the types of problems that come up really differ depending on the team, um, but really it's the underlying core is the same. It's um, how do we find customers to talk to every week? How do we make sure that in those conversations we're asking the right questions to get reliable feedback? Um, so there's sort of this research piece. How do we develop good research methods to get reliable feedback? Um, and then there's a lot around just sense making and um, synthesizing what we're learning and doing it in a really collaborative way. So a lot of the teams that I work with, this trio model where a product manager, a designer, and an engineer are jointly responsible for deciding what to build. Um, a lot of teams don't have experience with true collaboration. Like, yes, we work together, but we've never made a collaborative decision without falling back on the organizational hierarchy, right? And so one thing that I teach is how do we um, collaboratively make decisions so that everybody walks away feeling really good about the direction the team is going in. Um, and so that's a lot of what we work through as well. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, we, we have uh, several uh, uh, questions uh, already from Q&A. Uh, Andrea, back to you. No? Yeah, I think, you you know, we, we one of the misconceptions, you know, I think there's lots of misconceptions uh, related to continuous product discovery, Teresa. And what are the roles or who are the roles that need to be in the product discovery team? Because from what I understand, you usually work with a product manager, with, with a designer, with an engineer. So that's like the, the trio. Mm -hmm. But is, is it still the same um, uh, since we last spoke in 2016 and you kind of unfold this, this framework? Are, are you tweaking this somehow? Yeah, let's talk about this a little bit. So I think a product, like a, a product trio starts with that group, the product right. manager, the designer, and the engineer. Where does that come from? Well, we've learned that those three perspectives are what's required to build a good digital product. 
right? And some people like to break up like who's responsible for what. Um, and we can talk about that broadly, like a product manager is gonna bring the across the business view, which sometimes we talk about as viability. Uh, the designer is gonna um, bring that sort of usability uh, perspective of can the customer understand it? Can they find it? Are they, are they able to do what we need them to do? And the engineer is gonna bring that feasibility view of is, is this possible with technology? Um, I would argue that the entire trio is responsible, responsible for customer value or desirability. So does anybody want this? Are we creating value for the customer? And that's where that sort of collaborative um, model and true collaborative decision-making comes into play. Um, but a lot of teams now, we're starting to see more roles represented on product teams, right? So if you work on a data-heavy product, you might have a data analyst on your team. Um, yeah. If you're really lucky, you might have a user researcher on your team. Um, and so this idea of a trio can flex. I wouldn't say that a, tr a trio has to be defined as those three rules only. Mm -hmm. um, I see a lot of different versions of the trio. I think the key principle to think about is given the nature of your product, what are the cross-functional roles that need to be represented when making decisions about what to build? And then know that the bigger that core team is, the slower you will move. Mm -hmm. So you wanna trade off. I mean, some people think, well, we need to include everybody. And then you have an eight person trio in quotes right. and you don't ever make any decisions, right? Um, so you wanna go for the smallest team that can be nimble and move fast, but also represents the cross-functional expert the cross-functional expertise that you need. Yeah. Minimum viable trio. <laughs> so, That's right. <laughs> as a, a product manager, um, I, and I guess most of the people that are hearing us today, and we have like all, all 40 people or so, um, they're already convinced into product and continuous product discovery. But do you have any advice for people uh, starting to do this, uh, starting to do uh, continuous product discovery, and why should they do it? Yeah, the first, the, num the most common question I get is, okay, I'm sold. How do I do this at my company if my leaders aren't on board? Yeah. Um, and this is a tough question. So I think there's two ways to look at this. One is we get to choose where we work. So um, I think people need to put a lot more energy and discipline into choosing where to work and finding mm -hmm. like-minded people. That doesn't mean leave your job. That's <laughs> definitely not the advice that I'm giving you. I'm okay. just reminding people that we do have a choice that most of us in sort of the knowledge worker technology industry have a choice in where we work. I know that's yeah. not true for all of us. Um, yeah. and, then, and then two is uh, you have a lot more agency at your organization than you think. So even if you're not being tasked with an outcome, you individually can develop an outcome mindset. Uh, even if you're asked to be delivered, asked to deliver fixed solutions, you still can do the work to uncover the implied opportunities. Um, you still can do the work to uncover the assumptions behind those applied solutions. So I actually think no matter what kind of context you work in, you can start to adopt a lot of the underlying principles of discovery mm -hmm. and continuous discovery. Um, and especially in large bureaucratic, slow moving organizations, I really tell people, and again, I get myself in trouble by giving this advice, um, use your judgment when you follow this advice, uh, but you can rock the boat a little bit, right? Like we're so terrified of, of like pushing the boundaries that we think that horrible things are gonna happen. But more often than not, we put those boundaries around ourselves. It's not somebody else doing it. And in a lot of the organizations that I work with, I have the benefit of working with the individual teams and the leaders and it's amazing to me the gap between what leaders think they're telling teams and what teams are actually hearing. And I work in companies where the leader is saying, please go out and do this stuff. And the teams are saying, I'm not allowed to do this stuff. Mm. And so what I like to tell teams is you're probably allowed to do a lot more than you think. And you won't know until you start testing. Okay. But don't get fired. So use judgment. Right. Yeah. Uh, be a challenge, uh, but, but not. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Make some waves. So um, I think we're, we're heading towards the, the Q&A, but just before that, is there someone that in, still inspires you professionally today? And who, who motivated or what motivated you to become a, a product coach? Oh, that's a really good question. So um, I spent the first 14 years of my career, like most product people, I worked in design roles. I worked in product management roles. I worked my way up. Um, ran product and design teams. I ran a startup for a couple of years. Um, and what I saw was the same problem everywhere. The vast majority of product teams don't spend enough time with their customers. Even when I was running the product team, there's still sort of this broader challenge in the company of is product management valued? Um, how does the executive team want to make product decisions? And I realized like um, you could be 
um, I could I could work individually in a company and try to change one company at a time, um, but I realized that I was going to drive myself nuts doing that. Like it just would be slow, and I I was living in the San Francisco Bay Area. I was working at one small founder led company after venture backed founder led company after another, um, and it just felt like every job I had to start over. Um, and so what what led to me wanting to be a coach was just taking a more impactful approach to solving that problem. How can I help more companies than one at a time? start to adopt some of these better practices. Um, and then as far as where do I take inspiration from, we have a lot of inspiring people in the product industry. I just feel like we're um, at a point where there's just some spect spectacular folks. I'll name a few. Um, Melissa Perry, I think does phenomenal work. Uh, my partner, Hope Gurion, um, has recently become more of a voice in the space and does excellent work. Um, David Bland has a new book out and is, does really good work in the experiment space. Uh, Jeff Gothelf and Josh Seiden, the authors of Lean UX and Sense and Respond are, are adding amazing contributions to this space. Um, there's a, I, could, I could name a million people, um, yeah. but you know, really where I draw a ton of inspiration is just going back to uh, the research and what do we know? And so how do we look at inspiration from the industry and say, okay, it seems like the best companies are doing X, Y, and Z. How can we um, look for evidence for why that might work or not work? Right, so not just following the industry trends, but looking at what do we know from decision-making research? What do we know from problem-solving research? What do we know from critical thinking research? And how does that align with what we're seeing in the industry? Um, and that one of my goals with my book was to bring that research to the industry, to, to help make those connections and put a little bit more uh, heft behind. Um, this is more than just this is an industry best practice but this is industry best practice and here's what we know about it, how effective it is. Great. So do you have uh, time for maybe a couple or more, more than a couple of questions? Yeah, let's so do it. We, let's do it. Okay, so we have Stephanie with us. Hi, Stephanie. And Stephanie, uh, Chris Munch is uh, asking, how would you approach product discovery when you want to enter a new market with a new product and have no customers to ask to? Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, this is a, the situation that a lot of startups are in. And here's the thing, in the startup world, we talk about if you can't find customers to talk to, how are you gonna find customers to sell to, right? Asking a customer uh, for an interview is a much easier ask than asking for a sale. So if you don't have a product yet, you have to do a lot more work to find people to talk to, but if you, you that, that work is critical. It's not just the work you're doing to do your discovery. It's actually the early work you're doing to figure out can I reach this audience to even have, a, have something to sell to them? And so what I recommend teams do is there's, is, uh, there's a few principles that can, you can keep in mind. One is try to go to where they already hang out, right? So if your audience has user forums or LinkedIn groups or Facebook groups, wherever they already hang out, try to go there and don't just go in there and, and post, uh, hey, I need someone to participate in my research. That's not gonna be very effective go join those communities and get to know the people and build relationships and learn the norms and practices. And then when you go in there with an ask, you're asking as a community member, not as an outsider. Um, and that's actually the biggest mistake I see people make. In fact, in the, um, I'm part of a couple of really large sort of product related Slack communities and always somebody comes in and posts like, hey, here's my survey, will you fill it out? And I can't imagine that's effective, right? You're you're just jumping in and asking rather than figuring out how to be a part of and to give value and to, and to be part of the community. So that's the first thing. Um, you also can, a lot, of, a lot of startups find interview participants and actually early customers by creating landing pages and buying ads and driving ads to those pages. That's not easy, right? Finding the right keywords and getting that whole system set up and working well um, takes work. But again, it's work that's not only gonna fuel your discovery, it's also gonna fuel your first sales. Um, so I think for both startups and for brand new products, even at mature companies, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of work to do to figure out who your customer is, um, but it's critical work. And if you, can't, if you can't get them to talk to you, odds are you're not going to get them to buy your product. Right. We actually had a question here from Ricardo, uh, which was very similar. Uh, where would you focus your energy if you had a, a brand new product? Ricardo, if you want to jump into the conversation, feel free. If you want to tweak your own question, feel free. Otherwise, I'll just um, head on to the next question. So th this one is from Nuno. So Nuno is asking, what is the best way to quantify how does success look like? 
So this is a big part of outcome thinking, right? So when we're setting an outcome, we're starting with uh, what is, we're gonna do a bunch of work. We're gonna release some things. How are we gonna know if we're successful? So a good way to think about this is imagine it's six months from now and, and um, we had a ton of success. What, what metrics, what numbers in our business changed? How to find those numbers is actually not a trivial thing, right? So um, we have a class called Defining Outcomes where we teach this. So I'll, I'll give the basic structure of this. Um, every business on planet earth is focused on growing profit, right? Right. Profit it consists of increasing revenue and decreasing costs. So from there, we can break those down. And you know, inevitably, I, I hear from a nonprofit and they say, hey, that's, we're not focused on growing profit. Okay, well, nonprofits are focused on driving their mission and their mission is, can be broken down into increased development dollars, reduced costs. So it ends up being the same formula effectively, right? So then you can keep breaking those down um, and you can say, okay, how does this business- Sorry, sorry Teresa, can, can you repeat last, that last phrase? Because I, I, I think I, I, it was just too fast for me. For, so even ah. non-for-profit business, yeah. it's the same formula in your opinion? Because it's yeah. about reducing, uh, reducing costs, it's, it's about uh, impact, right? So yeah, so how, a, business, do, yeah. a business is trying to grow a profit, right? We can break right. that down into increase revenue, Absolutely. decrease costs. A non-profit is trying to have an impact on their mission Mm -hmm. So what are the levers that allows them to have an impact? They want to increase development dollars, increase donations, right? Okay. Yeah. That's their equivalent of increased revenue. Um, they still want to reduce costs because the more they can reduce costs, the more impact they're going to have. Sure. Um, the more, some the more effective they are. Some companies, like we're seeing a lot more of these triple bottom line companies where they might mm -hmm. actually have something um, high up that's also like increased sustainability or increased employee yeah. happiness or increased community value. You can put that up there too. The key is you want to start with what are the elements that are fundamental to your business? And that formula is pretty similar across businesses. Then you can say, okay, for our company, how do we generate revenue? And so we can give an example. Um, if we're looking at someone like Facebook, how does Facebook generate revenue? They, they increase ads sold. Okay, so how do we increase, or increase ad revenue? How do we increase ad revenue? We need to increase the number of eyeballs on our site. So that's gonna get you down to something like increase engagement. Um, but we need to do that without driving down customer satisfaction, right? Mm -hmm. So you can start to deconstruct your business outcomes into the corresponding product outcomes. And the distinction there is that a product outcome measures how your product drives the business outcome. Whereas a business outcome is more of a financial metric that's measuring the health of the business. And so when you're setting an outcome for your team, when you're trying to define what a success look like for mm -hmm. a product team, you wanna make sure you're measuring a behavior in your product because that's what's within the product team's control. All right. So um, one question we have here from Krishna. Uh, hi Krishna, if you're allowed to, to talk, if you want to, to do the question yourself, otherwise I can do the question. Uh, what methods- I'm happy to ask a question. You, you guys you, can you you are? Okay. okay, go on, go yeah, on Krishna. Let's, let's, let's do it, let's do it. Uh, hey, Teresa, uh, it's Christian from London, um, work at Pipe Drive. And the question I had was around um, actually um, how you go about having um, kind of systems you've seen that are effective to determine the most painful and most impactful problems to solve for. So often we find problems and we unearth them, but it's about actually uh, in a qual or quant way to really maybe stack rank and prioritize, okay, what are the most painful problems uh, we should solve for? Yeah, Krishna, thank you for your question. This is one um, that I actually spend a lot of time with. So um, there's a lot of ways to identify opportunities, right? So the primary way that, the way that I teach is through continuous interviewing. So interviewing customers week over week. For, the op for opportunities in particular, so customer problems, needs, pain points, um, I like qualitative research because I want to know the context in which the, op the, the pain point occurred, right? So it's, it's really hard to solve a good, to, to really solve a problem without understanding the context. And so qualitative research is really good at helping us unearth that context. Um, but it's not the only way, right? Um, uh, well, jobs to be done is another framework that helps you uncover those needs. And they also teach interview-based sort of um, opportunity discovery. Um, design thinking, IDO folks tend to go more the observation route. Most product teams don't have the luxury of observing customers every week. Uh, if you do, by all means, do that. Um, so that, the first step is how do you surface these opportunities? 
Um, the heart of your question I heard was the, what do we do with all of them? How do we prioritize yeah. them? How do we know which ones are most important? This is um, one of the primary reasons why I started to develop my opportunity solution tree. Um, if you're not familiar with that, it's just a visual that helps you chart out your best path um, to your desired outcome. And the heart of it is mapping out the opportunity space. And this is um, an activity that helps you make sense of all the needs, pain points, and desires that you're hearing, however you're collecting them, um, and really mapping them out in a structured way that allows you to quickly prioritize which ones are most important. And what are the factors that you're going to consider when prioritizing? Could be things like how many customers are affected how often. That could just be based on how often are you hearing it in your interviews. It could be more sophisticated. You could be looking at support tickets or page views or um, any sort of quantitative numbers that you have access to. Um, we also, when I teach teams, I teach them to also look at solving different problems will affect your position in the market, right? So the problems you choose to solve has a big impact on how you differentiate yourself from competitors. Um, your company strategy and strategic initiatives and sort of strategic context should come into play when choosing what problems to solve. And then of course, getting an understanding of not all problems are equally important to our customers and st starting to uncover how significant they are. And that's also where that qualitative research is really helpful. Um, but I'll also caution, I don't think there's a perfect prioritization for opportunities. And I like to, I like to encourage teams to think about your opportunity selection as a two-way door decision. It's a reversible decision. So the best way to test, did I pick the right opportunity is to start exploring solutions and start understanding, can you actually address this in a way that's creating value for the customer and the business? So I actually encourage teams to pick opportunities quickly and just get doing as quickly as possible, but stay open to the idea that you might've picked the wrong opportunity. Great, thank you. Thanks, thanks for it. So we have another question here from Carlos. Um, hi, Carlos, how are you? Uh, hello. Fine. Um, I think you personally already answered my question a, a bit, uh, with the, which was uh, what kind of methods can be used um, to identify those assumptions and opportunities with users, especially in a remote context, as we are yeah. right now, which is difficult to get deeper conversations with them. Uh, you mentioned already the communities, joining them in communities and driving ads. Do you have anything else? Yeah, so it's, let's, let's distinguish two things. So for discovering opportunities, so opportunities and assumptions are two different categories of things, right? So for discovering opportunities, I really like qualitative interviews. Um, like I said, if you can do observations, that's really valuable. I just don't know many teams that can do an observation every week. Um, in a remote world, I actually think for a lot of the teams that I'm working with, interviewing regularly is becoming easier. People's schedules are more flexible. They're more, they're more harried, right? We're working at home with our kids and our dogs interrupt and it's a little bit crazy out there, but we do see more flexibility in our schedule with people working from home. Um, the big mistake I see teams make is they ask for too much time. So don't ask for an hour, ask for 20 minutes um, and you'll see your response rate go way up. If your audience is really busy, ask for five minutes. Um, you actually can learn a lot in a really short five-minute interview. Um, as far as other places to find your customers, it depends on what your business is like. So in B2B context, um, in an enterprise context, rely on your customer-facing teams, your support teams, your account managers, your sales teams. Consumer companies, you can recruit people while they're using your product. Um, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of ways to do that, but really just looking at how do you recruit while you already have their attention. Yeah, that's a great, we should quote you. Uh, don't ask for 20 minutes, ask for five sometimes, that's enough. You know, five is infinite times better than zero. So- That's right. Uh, <laughs> Anna, Anna Peralta, um, she's asking, any tips to get customers to be available and happy to meet with the product team during discovery phase? I guess, you know, it's, it's basically what we said, right? It's um, ask for last time, maybe try to, um, I don't know, try to, how to convince people to get into the discovery phase. And I think uh, Anna is, is, uh, was, was talking about uh, interviews mostly uh, with I, customers. I can expand on this a little bit. So one of the you things mind? that I teach teams, no, not at all. Um, one of the things that I teach teams is to automate their recruiting process, right? Mm -hmm. If you have to hustle every week to find someone to interview, you're not going to do it. So the benchmark I give them is I want you to wake up on Monday morning and already have an interview on your calendar where you didn't have to do anything. 
-hmm. There's a lot of ways to do this. The right. variables you have to get right is you have to make a small ask in exchange for a big reward. So you want to put yourself in your customer's shoes and say what would be really easy for them to say yes to. So if your customers are busy doctors, you're probably asking for five minutes of their time and you're giving them something very valuable in exchange because they don't have a lot of time to give, right? If your um, customers are Facebook users, uh, you probably that's everybody, right? So you probably could find someone to talk to you. Again, small ask and still something valuable in exchange, but you probably could ask for 20 minutes of their time because they have more than five minutes to give you. Um, what's a big reward? So a lot of people think about compensation as cash, but it doesn't always have to be cash. In an enterprise context, cash is rarely gonna work. It can be things like a discount on your service. It could be things like um, access to an exclusive webinar. It could be things like access to a premium support line. It could be, I worked with a company that worked with first time home buyers and they gave access to like, here's a, a webinar about here's how, a more, how your mortgage is gonna work, right? Really valuable for a first time home buyer who's never had a mortgage. Um, so the key is to think about what's valuable for your customer that's reasonably low cost for your company to offer and then pair something valuable with a small ask. All right, that's super insightful. And we, we have like a almost last question because I know you have to leave in a couple of minutes. So this, this one is from Robert Varga. Robert, are, are you there? If not, I, I'm just going to read your question. So I'm also interested in methods for product discovery and what other company parts like marketing, sales, you would definitely want to join in the product discovery mindset or you know, um, invite them. What, 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 what other parts of the company do you think are really critical in the process as well? Yeah, so I actually, this is where I met, earlier I said, I think that product teams are leading where business is going to end up. So when we talk about product discovery, especially current product discovery practices, what we're talking about is how do we get to know our customer? How do we learn what their unmet needs, unmet pain points, unmet desires are, and really design with them around how do we address these challenges? If I look at sales, a good salesperson is discovering those unmet needs and then aligning your product as the solution to those needs. If I look at marketing, marketing is identifying the benefits of your product and marketing the benefits of the product, which by the way, the benefits of the product are you solve these problems for me. So I actually think all of business is geared around how do we address our customers' needs, pain points and desires, their opportunities. And that's because the goal of a business is to serve a customer, right? Now, in today's business culture, we've lost sight of that a little bit, right? We have a lot of salespeople who don't focus on customer needs and they just tout the features of the product. We have a lot of marketing people that market features and not benefits. Some of this is just our business culture of, especially in the US, quarter over quarter earnings and short termism and, and things that as product people, we're not gonna fix. I think in the immediate term, if you're on a product team and you're trying to figure out who in the organization to include in your discovery, I would think about where you are. Is your sales team happily selling your product? If they're not, I would bring them in to be part of your discovery and help them learn about the unmet customer needs and pain points that your product can address. If your go-to-market strategy is great and your marketing team is doing an awesome job, then you probably don't need to include them. If they could use some help with what are the benefits of this product, you might want to invite them to be part of your discovery. But I will reiterate what I said earlier, the bigger your discovery team, the slower you will go. So you have to make those trade-offs between what's most important right now so that you can still move fast. But including different stakeholders in your discovery is a great way to get everybody aligned. Absolutely. So this is the last one. Carlos, if you are there, this is your yeah. opportunity. Yeah, hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, Teresa. So my question is about product market fit. So this is something that any company wants in order to have a successful product. And my question is, how do we know that we actually achieved product market fit? Is this something that we just feel that we have achieved or is something we can quantify? Yeah, so first of all, product market fit is not a moment in time, right? You can, it's something that is, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a state that exists that is happening or not. You can fall in and out of product market fit. Um, so that's the first thing. It's not like we cross the line, we now have product market fit. Um, to me, when I think about product market fit, what am I looking for? Um, am I seeing uh, 
our product resonate with customer that like, am I seeing our product create customer value in a way that also creates business value? And this is a really important distinction, right? I can create a, I can create, I can create a product that everybody loves, but they're not willing to pay for. That's not creating business value. So I don't yet have product market fit. So what I want to look for is, am I satisfying customer needs, pain points, or desires? I collectively call those opportunities in a way that's also driving my business outcome. That's what's going to measure am I creating business value? And both, I think, are equally important. And the reason why I say it's not a moment in time is that I can be solving customer needs in a way that's driving business value, and then something changes in the world. And I, the needs change, and my product no longer meets the needs. Or my business changes, and my product is no longer creating value for the business. So a lot of teams think about product market fit is a point that we have to get to. I think a product team is always focused on not just getting to product market fit, but maintaining product market fit. And this is where 2020 taught us. Our opportunity space is going to always involve, evolve. Your outcome should always evolve. And so product market fit is making sure that your solutions align with your opportunity space in a way that drives your outcome. Thank you. All right. That was it. We are just a little bit over 45. <laughs> so thank you, Teresa. Thank you so much for your time and the opportunity to have this live Q&A with you. It was really, really great. Um, if we don't see each other before, uh, let's see each other May 28th on the Productize Masterclasses. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It's been a ton of fun. And hopefully I'll see some of you in that masterclass. Thank hopefully you, Teresa. So. Thank, you. Thank you. Have a nice day. And uh, Teresa, you, you're free to go if you want. And for the rest of um, you guys that want to stay, I'm just going to raffle our Productize Masterclass ticket that I had promised and tell you that um, we also have a digital product management course uh, upcoming with Catholic Lisbon um, that is coming in April the 14th. This is a, a program which is 100% online and um, you have also capstone projects. Um, if you're still considering a career in PM, well, uh, remote landing jobs, uh, tech career report just came out last week and Product management was um, one of the top careers uh, in, in Portugal with, with an average salary of 40K, which means that it's the best paid IT job before you reach a leadership position like CTO or tech lead. Um, and in, in Portugal, with over six years experience uh, on average, uh, product managers can expect to make 75K per year. So... Uh, what kind of professionals would benefit from this digital product management course? Um, you know, anyone that is working on a medium or large organization that wants to understand a little bit better what digital product management uh, is, professionals that are going um, through digital transformation processes on, on their companies, or any kind of professional from fast-growing product companies that are not products people but want to be trained has product innovation and product management. So the competencies that you build will be about digital product management, a little bit about product design sprints, market research, customer validation, customer validation, agile product development frameworks, and online innovation workshop facilitation by our own uh, Rafael Daro, also here today, and a little bit on digital transformation. The course is starting um, April 14th, it's uh, seven weeks part-time and costs nine, uh, 1,950 euros uh, with the faculty composed by Andrea Alkerk, um, VP of Product at Kitsch and ex uni Places, René Bonchak, an assistant professor at Catolica, Paul Gaudencio with us today, product specialist and also freelance product manager, and Rafael Daron, design sprint master. So uh, you can apply for free to the spring cohort um, and then the Catholic team will reach out to you to understand whether this is a good fit. And now the moment that we have been waiting for, the special raffle for the master ticket. So the way that I'm going to do this is a super advanced um, algorithm, which is a will of fortune. Hopefully this will work out well. So I will be spinning this. Can you guys see the spin? Are you ready? Yeah? All right, let's do this. 
control enter the spin I have to click somewhere I have to accept it okay oh, it's spinning so it's spinning and if you are here with us you get the ticket um our marketing team so Carlos Carlos P all right Carlos are you there are you still there yeah thank you you were thank you Congratulations, you got, a, you got a free ticket um, to the Productize Masterclasses. Our uh, marketing team will reach out to you, um, so um, you don't have to do anything. Uh, we'll reach out to your registration email with a promo code. Just don't forget to register today, so it's effective today, okay? So guys, if there's, this is it, see you very, very soon, because next week we will be having Gibson Biddle and we'll be talking about product leadership. And I think it went so well, Paulo, that we should do, do it together again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, André. Thank you for Thank inviting you. me. It's such sure. an honor to be here. Thank you. It was really good to have you as well. Bye-bye, guys. See you next week. Bye-bye.